thanks for being here for this last lecture. Um, so maybe I'll just briefly tell you what we did uh, yesterday, although today will be a little bit different. So um, yesterday I was interested in studying global solutions to the Navier-Stokes equations and seeing whatever properties we could try to get for those global solutions. And the idea most of the time was to try to use as much as possible uh, the structure of the equations. We're not trying to prove general results on parabolic um, equations with some kind of nonlinearity. We're really trying to prove results which would be true uh, for Navier-Stokes, not for any equation. Again, the reason for that is that you can cook up examples of equations which look like Navier-Stokes. For instance, uh, so what I did with Marius Paikou uh, a few years ago was build an equation actually in 2D or 3D uh, for which a divergence-free condition was preserved for all time, for which uh, you had the same scaling as Navier-Stokes. All the fixed point results were true for, that, uh, for those equations in 2D or 3D, but there was blow up in finite time. And actually the initial data that gave rise to uh, a blow up in finite time, whatever, whatever its size precisely was an example of initial data giving rise to a global solution for Navier-Stokes, which we'd found for, um, with a chemin a few, uh, a few years before. So that's one example. You have to use a divergence free condition, but it's not enough to, because of those examples. And then there's more recently, I think in 2014, the result by uh, Terry Tao sa saying you can also invent an equation for which the energy is also preserved and for which you also have a uh, blow up in finite time. So it's not Navier Stokes, and, but it's very, very close and still there's blow up. So again, uh, yesterday and also today, we'll really try to um, use the structure of the equation as much as possible, either using the fact that the 2D equation is well posed and that uses the structure of the equation or using the energy um, conservation that of course also uses, uses the structure, although we know it's not enough. Okay, so today what we'll try to study rather than the global uh, behavior of solutions is the behavior at blow up time, supposing such a time exists. So uh, from my point of view, it's harder, it's a harder question because at least the way I study global solutions, at every time I study a global solution, at some point something's gonna be small because I'm lucky where I've done everything so that at some point something is small. And then when something is small, then you're sort of in good shape to study the global um, properties. So when you're looking at blow up, obviously it's much harder because nothing much is small in that case. But so I don't have so much things to tell you, but I'll try to give you some old or uh, newer results on the behavior of the solutions um, near blow up time. Again, supposing such a time exists. So how do you define that blow up time? So I won't go through the fact that uh, whatever the definition you want to give is going to be the same, which is not obvious at all. Right? If you do your fix, if you take a smooth initial data and you do a fixed point in L3 or an H1 half, you get the same blow up time. Okay, you better get the same one possible. It's strange, but, but it does work, but I won't go through that um, today. So let me just give the, the very uh, crude definition of the blow up time, which is the time at which the norm in which you've done a fixed point blows up. Okay? And, We'll have to accept uh, for today that whatever your choice of space, then it's going to be the same blow of time. Okay, so let me just give you uh, examples we saw yesterday. Most of them I think we saw yesterday. So you can do your fixed point in a lot of spaces. Here I just gave you a uh, Sabalov spaces or uh, LP spaces. So this is probably the original, um, well, not exactly actually, but it's sort of a, like a Cato space. Uh, in which you've replaced the LP by an H. It's not a, the Fujita-Kato method either. They didn't use a fixed point to solve their, their the equation. They used more an energy method in H1 hat. But this is a typical uh, space in which you can do a fixed point. Then again, as we saw uh, maybe yesterday or not, you can replace that T to the one quarter by taking L4 in time. Same scaling, obviously, and you can also do your fixed point in that space. Then if you don't like L4, you want something more general, you can take any LP essentially, uh, and then Again, because of scaling, you don't have much choice. Sorry, this is in dimension three. You don't have much choice about the power you have to put here in dimension three. If it's another dimension, just take uh, D minus one over two plus, uh, sorry, yeah. D over two minus one plus two over P. That's the general uh, thing you should put. H one half plus two over P in dimension three. And then in general, if you don't like uh, smaller spaces, you can also put weights in time, just like a like Kato. And so all those are examples in which you can do your fixed point. And then the blow up time will be, what you have to remember here is that blow up means those norms blow up when T goes to T star, okay? And the reason why I showed you those, those uh, spaces is that 
in each of these cases, you see you have a wait, right, in your, in your a wait in, in time in your space, either a power of time or an integral in time, right? So that means that, um, that explains in some sense why small time works for large data, because you always have this wait or this integral in time. But that also means that the fixed point doesn't tell you if the norm in which you chose your initial data to make the fixed point work, it doesn't tell you if that norm blows up in finite time. Okay, what you know is that those norms will blow up, right? But you're not certain that if you choose your initial data in L3, then the L3 norm will blow up. Because it's known that you can't do the fixed point just in L infinity L3, right? So that's a natural question we'll be addressing at some point is uh, what happens to the norm in which you took your initial data with that norm blow up in finite time as well. So uh, Idris showed us yesterday um, those very famous Loret, Prodi, Lezef, Kaya, Sierin uh, um, blow up conditions. So this is a typical uh, fixed point norm. So it's been known for a long time, for instance, that if you take an LR norm in time with values in LP and R3, or in any dimension uh, essentially, then this blows up at the blow up time. Okay, under this condition that R must be finite, again, I don't know what happens to the LD norm or the L3 norm. And the scaling condition, so as you probably noticed, I like scaling variance. So it's true more generally, but I prefer always writing down uh, scaling variance um, quantities. And so the scaling here, you don't have any choice. R is a scaling of time. Time counts like two space derivatives, dt and Laplacian. And so you have a two over R because time counts for two uh, dimensions in some sense, and three over P because three is a dimension in space. And that's equal to one because you want us something which is scaling variant. Right, so another way of understanding those blow up criteria is saying, if you know your solution is an LR LP up to some time T, then you know you're smooth from zero, maybe not at zero, but uh, instantaneously you're smooth and until time T. Okay, it's another way of understanding um, blow up criteria. So uh, what I'll explain today are some results concerning first lower bounds for the blow up time. Can you compute the blow up time? If I know u zero, if I assume the blow up time is finite, and there is a blow up time, how large is it or how small is it uh, compared to the initial data? And again, uh, I'd like to see what the dependence on the blow up time is on quantities which use, again, the structure of the equation as much as possible. If I have a lower bound on the blow up time, it also, also in some sense gives the uh, an upper bound on the size of the solution at blow up, as we'll see. So that's interesting to know how, how not too small blow up time is. I need a lower bound. And then related to that question, we'll try to see what kind of norms in space blow up at blow up time. So not L RLP norms, not weighted in time norms, but space norms. Okay, so as T goes to, infinite, uh, to blow up time, what happens to the norm of the initial data? Does it blow up as well at blow up time? So th those are essentially the two types of uh, questions I'd like to, to discuss today. Right, so uh, as I said, if you're in a scale invariant space, you have a fixed point, you don't know if the norm in the scale invariant space blows up. But if you're in a non scale invariant space, then it's not hard at all to find, uh, in general, to find uh, a rate for blow up. Right? So here I wrote a result, result which is not totally obvious to prove. The obvious result you could, almost obvious, would be if you take your initial data u0 in h one half plus something. Okay, let me, sorry, I think I put the two gamma here then it's really just by scaling, if you have blow up in finite time, you get a bound like this, a constant depending on gamma, and then the same thing at below, t star minus t to the gamma. Okay, and that's in the same norm. So we call that x, that's an x. Okay, as long as the gamma is positive. So this is really, um, the result I wrote here in symbolic uh, spaces is just a scaling argument, nothing else to prove that. The result we proved is Jean Schumann. We wanted to prove that because uh, we wanted to compare whatever we're, I'm going to show you later on to, um, to the best possible thing you want to do. And as usual, as I told you lots of times, the best possible norm you want to compute would be a limit space of space norm. Okay, H1 half is not enough, or H1 half plus something. You, if you want really to compare things, you have to take the largest possible space. So it's not exactly a scaling variant, uh, uh, just a scaling argument that gives you this bound but the bound is scale invariant. It's uh, 
the setting is really just revisiting the fixed point and trying to follow constants and really not, nothing very uh, fancy here. But all we're saying here is that if you have a smooth initial data, right, and you want to compute the maximum time of existence, then if your initial data is smooth, it's in, you can take it in particular in that space, and the fixed point norm, that's my definition of a fixed point norm, uh, time, sorry, it's the fixed point time will be always um, this quantity here, the lifespan of u0 will always be larger than this time, which we call a fixed point. Okay, so you can compute a lower bound for the lifespan of the, of the initial data, the lifespan of the solution, by a constant depending on gamma and this uh, negative uh, power of u0 in this space, which is the largest possible space, which is not scaling invariant. Okay, okay, so you have a rate. Another way of understanding this is a rate of blow up of a non scaling invariant. Okay, if you're scaling variant, even if you do blow up, it's going to be very hard to find a rate because you're scaling variant, so the rate has to be scaling variant. But if you're not scaling variant, you get a rate, and it's given by this power. This power. Okay, so that's just a fixed point. It has nothing to do with the structure of the equation. Just follow your proof, your favorite proof of a fixed point, which is what you get. Now, uh, let me go slowly through this um, this theorem, which doesn't look very nice, but uh, I'll try to explain why we're sort of happy in the way that. Result. So again, I take an initial data which is as smooth as I want. Uh, I'm not interested in a rough initial data, as smooth as you want. All I want to do is compute the size of the blow up time, supposing it exists. If I get plus infinity, I'll be very happy. If I don't, well, it just gives me a lower bound for the blow up time. And so, what we prove, uh, what we state in the theorem is the following the blow up time of your initial data, of the solution, is always larger than this t sub L, L means linear, we'll see why. And this time by definition, and that's the, the theorem, is given by this horrible quantity. So I agree if you find it horrible, you should, but, but let's just look at what it looks like. So this quantity is saying it depends on anything which has a sub L here means linear. So it just depends on norms of the linear flow. So those guys are global, right? It's integrals from zero to infinity. You don't have to put any, anything uh, finite here. So it's global quantities depending only on the initial data in a linear way, right? Because this UL is a linear flow, heat flow. But the whole quantity here is nonlinear. Okay, so you have a Q0, which is just the, the, the first iterate in some sense of the Picard scheme. Okay, so it's just plugging in the, the heat flow in the equation, see what comes out, with a weight in time, which is just given by scaling. And then this Q1 here is essentially the same thing where we've taken third derivatives. Okay, and then you have a wait in time again, so you have not much choice about it. Okay, and then this term here, uh, again, you have a third derivative. Okay, so what you see on this lower bound here is only quantities, nonlinear quantities, depending only on the heat flow, which are easy to compute, and anything else only depends on the third der uh, der uh, derivative third direction derivative of u0. Okay, and same here. In particular, you see if your initial data is 2D, then this is 0, q0, oh, sorry, q1 is 0, because there's no d3, and since you're taking an inverse power here, you get tl is equal to plus infinity. Okay, so this uh, lower bound gives you in particular the fact that 2D equations are closed, which we knew for a long time, but that was sort of what we wanted to try to, to find, were lower bounds as simple in some sense as possible, so maybe it doesn't look simple, but the quantities involved are actually uh, maybe quite well, essentially natural. They're nonlinear, which is nice in some sense. And uh, you recover the fact that 2D uh, many six is well posed. And what you also recover are assumptions you can make on your initial data to make your solution live as long as possible. Okay, if this nonlinear quantity is small, then the inverse is large and your time is large. For instance, if you have spherical, um, uh, symmetry, everyone knows this is zero, and then you get a global solution, but that's not a, that wasn't known for a long time. But you can also, and that was a game we played with uh, Jean-Yves Chemin a long time ago, you can also cook up examples of initial data, which are as large as you want, but for which this quantity, P, projector, projector onto divergence free vector fields of UL gradient UL, is as small as you want. So then your time gets as large as you want for large data. Okay, so, okay, so that's a, a lower bound. So how do you prove this result? I won't give you the proof. It's not very hard. It's essentially energy estimates. 
but we're in a scale invariant setting. So I want to show you this, this estimate because I like it very much, although we don't know how to use it in any other way. But I think it's nice. It's, I, we were, this result, with this estimate was actually essentially already present in the paper by Chemin and Planchon from a few years ago. And uh, the reason why I like it is the purely energy estimate, but in a scale invariant space. More precisely, if you take your solution U and you subtract the heat flow, so if you use the, the, the terminology by um, Meyer, this is the tendency and this is the fluctuation, right? So you look at the fluctuation. E is the energy for any, any vector field U. I didn't find the usual Lure energy, maybe Stokes energy. What we're saying here is that you, if you take the fluctuation, you divide it by T to the one quarter and you can you compute the energy of that. This is scale invariant. You have to believe me or check it. This is a scale invariant quantity, but it's based on L2, nothing else in L2. This is controlled by this nonlinear thing of, of the initial data, which I wrote you before, Q0L, okay, times the exponential of the Spetzel norm of the initial data. Remember, this, uh, this is scales like H1 half, but it's a larger space uh, you can think of for negative states, essentially. Okay, and then for free, you also even have this norm, which is not given by the energy, it's uh, some kind of damping term you have also for free. So this estimate is a, maybe a little bit strange the first time you see it because it's a global estimate, right? My initial data might give you a, a, a solution that blows up in finite time. So W in lots of scaling variance spaces and all um, fixed point spaces blows up. But in this scaling variance space, it doesn't blow up. It's global and it satisfies this estimate. Okay, so uh, I, I think I like this estimate because for all the reasons I told you, it's energy and it's scale invariant and it's global. So nothing can happen to W in this, those norms and those norm, norms are scale invariant. So you want to say, okay, well then nothing can happen to W. Of course, that's not the case. And uh, if you think a tiny bit about this estimate, if you look at it for just a second and you think about it, you see it's totally useless when time is large. Okay, I mean, I shouldn't be saying that, but it's true, right? I mean, if time is zero, this is telling you something about W telling you it's zero, it's zero. Okay, we knew that, right? Because the, it's the fluctuation. And it's telling you essentially how small it is in small times. But obviously, as, as soon as time is not small, this is nothing better than the energy of W. So actually, uh, it's a little bit sad, but this, and, and this estimate is actually not telling you anything for large times. Although it looks like it's telling you something. Well, not, not much anyway. We haven't been able to use the estimate in any other way, except for the proof of the previous theorem. Okay, but still, I liked. Uh, I wanted to show you this estimate because I find it's nice, although it's not very useful in the end, except for the previous year. Okay, so um, still, so I gave you that uh, that statement. I sort of told you uh, it was uh, interesting because it tells you stuff which only depends on one directional uh, derivative, which is nice because you recover two D Navier-Stokes, and it tells you that if you're clever enough, you can cook, cook up examples where this is very very small, so the time is very very long. Okay, so let me show you an example. So the, the abstract theorem is the following. You can find some family of initial data depending on some epsilon, such, such that if you compute the fixed point blow up time, remember I, I defined this fixed point blow up time before. So the, just blow up time that is given uh, to you almost for free by the fixed point argument in any Bessel space you like. Well, this is going to zero with epsilon, like epsilon squared, okay, up to a lot. So Okay, that happens. So it's very, very small time given by the fixed point, but our linear type quantities, right? Our, our theorem is actually giving you a time that goes to infinity with epsilon. Okay, so you have initial data. I'm not saying, of course, this initial data blows up in finite time, right? No one knows that. But if you compute the fixed point time, you get something very, very small, which means the data in some sense uh, is large. Okay, but still the time we find with our theorem is going to infinity with epsilon. So it's not, a, a, it's not just totally empty. And so I'll just give you the example. It looks very much like the example I told you uh, in the introduction of this lecture we got with Schumann. This example essentially, if you put just one over epsilon here, so it's a diversion, diver, it's a function, sorry, but then you can build up um, 3D uh, divergent free vector field just by putting this guy here, this vector and dividing my epsilon. And then, uh, so that gives you, um, I'm not even by dividing, just this thing is divergence-free, obviously. If you take uh, this formula, this general thing, 
this is a formula for, sorry, this is f epsilon, right? So if I take a sub epsilon in front of a function, like here, I'm doing exactly what we said, multiplying by, by this oscillation and dilating a little bit one variable. So if I do that, I cook up a diverge free vector field. If I divide by epsilon, not by the log, then this gives you a global solution to Media Stokes. That's the theorem we got with, uh, with Schumann a long time ago. And this blows up for the Navier Stokes type equation that I talked about before we got with um, Marius Paikou. Now, if you make it even larger and multiply by one over square root of log, which is not much larger, but still it is larger, then I don't know if the solution to Navier Stokes is global with that. Okay, maybe it is, but I don't know. But if I compute the fixed point time just by computing norms, because the fixed point time was just a question of norms, I get something very small. If I compute the, nor the, the, the time given by the previous theorem, everything has been cooked up in such a way that it goes to infinity essentially as fast as life. Okay. Right, and this is very smooth initial data, right? If phi is smooth and can be supported. So, okay, so I'll stop with this, this, uh, this example of um, initial, uh, sorry, of a um, of lower bound for the blow up time of the Navier Stokes equations, which is not a lower bound for any equation that looks like Navier Stokes, it's exactly for Navier Stokes, and which in some cases is much better than what just the fixed point would give you. So maybe you've understood from the previous example that what I'm interested in is um, trying to see somewhere some special derivatives, some special directions where you could, where everything is encoded in like in one derivative, one uh, directional der derivative, or maybe one component. Okay. What what you'd like to do, or what I'd like to do maybe, is say I know 2D Navier Stokes is well posed. So if something goes wrong with Navier Stokes, one component should go wrong, right? Because the 2D part is fine. So maybe it's just because one component is going wrong that something happens. Okay. So for for instance. So we know just by the fixed point that this norm here, LP in time with, in 3D with this pair of uh, symbolic norm, this blows up for finite P. This is the fixed point. Uh, Jean-Yves Chemin, Pingzang, and Zifa Yizang in 17 proved that actually the same thing holds for P large enough, just taking one component. Okay, so when I'm saying I'm taking one component, of course, you don't like U3, you can take U1, it's the same, or any direction. So what this theorem is telling you is, is that if something goes wrong for Navier Stokes, then it goes desperately wrong. Every component blows up, right? Because U3 is uh, just any component. Give me a component, anything, not even U1, U2, any, any uh, direction you like, U dot sigma, where sigma is uh, on the sphere, this blows up. So it's a kind of isotropy uh, result saying if something goes wrong for Navier Stokes, it's not just one component that's going wrong, everything's going wrong. Okay, so they got that result for p larger than four, and it turns out so the proof was uh, rather technical. It goes after a number of results uh, by a lot of people. So I just gave a few names here. So that it's been a long time that people have been under, uh, interested in understanding what happens at the time and it, does everything blow up or just one direction. So to my knowledge, all the previous results were in non-scaling variant spaces. And building from all those uh, arguments, they got this result in a scale invariant space. It was uh, rather uh, technical in some sense. And um, with uh, Chemin and Pingzang, a little bit later, we got uh, a proof of a different result, just taking p equal to 2. So it's just one example. L2 H3 halves, that's the usual uh, Bezoff, uh, sorry, the usual fixed point norm, L2 3 halves. And we say that the L2 3 halves norm blows up in every direction at lower time. Okay, so that's a, a slight extension of uh, their result, but the proof is so much easier that I can just show you in a few lines the, the general idea of the proof. Okay, it's much less technical than their result because we're in L2, and L2 means you can use energy estimates, and that's what we did. So uh, let me give you a, a little idea of the proof. So the idea is to say uh, we're going to use the structure of the, uh, of the equation using this time just a divergence free actually condition. The 2D equation has nothing to do with this and um, was really an or the energy in some sense, but the divergence free. So let me uh, show you how. So what you do is take horizontal derivatives. So like yesterday, when I say a gradient H, I mean the horizontal gradient. So again, just fix one direction, the side is direction three, and write down an energy estimate on the horizontal derivatives of your solution. 
So, okay, everything is smooth, right? So you, can, you don't have to justify anything here. Everything is smooth until the load time, then I don't know what happens. And so uh, what you do is just take horizontal derivatives. So that's why I'm summing from one to two and apply di to the equation, multiply by di u and see what happens. And so you get four types of terms. So we shouldn't worry too much about those terms, but just I want to see what they look like. And I notice that most of them only have horizontal derivatives, right? The first one is horizontal only. Second one is only horizontal. Third one doesn't look so good. And the last one is also only horizontal because I'm divergence free. So D3 U3 is actually the horizontal divergence of U. Okay, so those three terms, we can forget about them, but the three terms I mentioned, the first, second, and fourth, are sums of terms of the type, I have horizontal components of U, a third component, and then only, or a horizontal one actually, and then only horizontal derivatives. And that's the most important point to remember and to notice is that I only have horizontal derivatives. Okay, and then you just use a Hölder inequality, put everyone in L3, it's the easiest thing you can do. And uh, what you get in the end, just by using symbolic embeddings, that's really just like a fugitive argument, but at a level of H1. Uh, use uh, symbolic embeddings to replace L3 by H1 half, and you have one derivative in H1 half, that's exactly the H3 halves of U3, so you're very happy. This is going to control the equation. And the rest here is just computed by Gronwall. Okay, because I'm exactly computing this energy here. So the H1 half, the H1 norm here to the squared is just eaten up by, by this term, and I apply ground law. So if there wasn't the time, the term E3, I'd be done, I'd even have a global estimate. Okay, and so, and as long as this is under control, I'd be under control. So using the divergence free uh, condition, I get in a very easy way the control of every single term except for one. And uh, this, uh, this term is quite a bit harder to compute and to estimate, so I won't really show you how to do it. But this is a, a nightmare because you see you have a D3 acting on a horizontal component, and I don't want that, I want U3. So of course I could integrate by parts and pull a, put a D3 U3 here, that's fine. But then if I do that, I also have a D3 UL and then I have the same problem again. So there's no miracle here. You just have to, or maybe there is, but we didn't see it. So you just have to struggle with that term but you want it to cost as little as possible and you want it only to cost U3 in H1, in H3 halves. That's, that's the game you want to play, right? So the question is, can I control this term just by quantities I know? So that will be eaten up by the viscosity and I'll have a, some kind of a ground wall here. Okay, so can I control things? I even have the energy here. So I want to control this term by quantities I am controlling then use ground wall, the energy possibly, and this guy, which was going to tell me if I blow up or not in time. And so this estimates, to prove it, you see it's a logarithmic estimate. And I won't really show you how to prove it, but what you do is truncate in frequencies, it's something you like to do, except that just uh, low and high frequencies is not enough. You also have to see what happens at medium horizontal frequencies. Okay, so the um, flat term here is very small horizontal frequencies. Sharp term here is very large horizontal frequencies, and this um, natural term is intermediate frequencies. So you don't want to see exactly what happens, but you just want to guess essentially what you hope for is when you have very small frequencies, well, you pay by the size of the frequency in your estimate. If you have very large frequencies, you gain the very large frequency. And if you're intermediate, just summing over frequencies, it's not so hard to see, you lose a lot. And then you optimize on capital lambda and small lambda and you're done. Okay, so just a frequency truncation, being a little bit careful about what happens in the, in the bulk of the frequencies, losing a logarithm gives you uh, this estimate here. And once you have this estimate, just conclude by ball. So again, I'm using the structure of the, of the nonlinear term at some places, very much, uh, uh, I guess, in here, you couldn't just throw any derivative and any component, you're really using the structure of the nonlinear term. In, in some way. So if you don't like uh, those, uh, those norms, you could wonder, can we do something? One question I'm interested in is, okay, I'm very happy. I've proved a theorem where just any component in LP, L, LQ, LP, H, H something blows up. What happens to the H1 half norm? I'd love to prove that the H1 half norm, okay, if it blows up in every direction, that would be great, but at least uh, it, it gives some control in the equation for only one component. Okay, so I'd like to say that at low up time, no component of my solution can be small in H1 half. That I'd like to prove, 
but I can't prove it. Uh, it would probably be related to the fact that you could solve Navier-Stokes for small initial data, measuring it only in one direction. That's something I would like to, to know if it's true, but I don't know if it's true or not, right? A theorem saying if U3 is small initially, then you have a global solution. That would be nice, but I don't know. So we tried to do something like that. We turned around it and because of the log loss in the previous slide, we had to define a space which is not exactly H1 half. It's H1 half log, meaning H1 half, you don't have this log here, right? You just have psi Fourier transform squared. That's H1 half. And what we do here is we perturb that, we multiply by logarithm of the horizontal frequency, just because we saw the previous proof and we saw that was what was actually the enemy in our, in our, in our estimates. And what you can prove in that case, and we did that in the same paper, is that if you're, you're ready to compute your solution, not in H1 half, but in a slightly smaller space, logarithmically smaller, then you, you're sure that every component not blows up, because that, again, we can't prove, but at least is bounded from below, at lower time. Okay, so nothing is small. There is this constant C0. I don't know how large it is, but you can't go below in any direction. Okay, so again, it's telling you that blow up is very isotropic. You can't, I mean, one direction can't just pretend not to be there and to be very small. Everyone has to be at least larger than some constant. Okay. And the proof of this I won't give you, but it's essentially following the um, frequency truncations we, I gave you before and where we couldn't sum because there was this logarithmic loss. Uh, now we can because we put the norm we wanted. Okay. Uh, right. So now let's go back to blow up just in the time that's left. And the other question I was interested in and I told you we'll be uh, discussing today is what happens to the H1 half norm at blow up, to the L3 norm, to all those Bezoff norms. I choose my initial data, I measure it in some norm. Does that norm blow up in finite time? Okay, so the previous example I gave you, we're not saying it blows up, right? Not even in the H1 half log. We're just saying it's bounded from below. But now the question is, do, does the H1 hat norm blow up at the time? And maybe even would there be a rate? So um, this goes back to Luray. I guess you've seen this example before, the self-similar blow up. So Luray wondered in his paper, does such a solution exist for Navier Stokes? If it does, then you have blow up in finite time. You compute very easily that all the Luray produits, like Zenkaya norms blow up. It's very easy to compute except for r equal to infinity, because in that case, it's just a constant. Okay, so that's the simplest uh, example of a blowing up solution. And as you probably know, that was ruled out as uh, early as 1994. Well, it was not that early compared to Bure, but uh, a few years ago now. And they proved, Nietzsche's Rusik and Zverag, that the only possible solution of Navier Stokes under this self-similar form is zero. So there were many extensions of that result that I won't be talking about here, where you could modulate a tiny bit the scaling, but um, I'll just stop there for that example. And so this was the first case where you expected an L infinity L3 blow up, but then it didn't work. And then we had to wait for about 10 years for Svirak with his Gorias and Zeregin to prove that actually, at least in limb soup, the L3 norm always blows up at the time. So that was a very spectacular result at the time. Um, and the proof is as often in that kind of situation is an argument by contradiction. So what they do is they rescale the solution near the possible blow up time. That gives you a new type of solution and they find that new type of solution vanishes at infinity in space. And then by unique continuation, backward uniqueness, which is uh, uh, actually very technical as well, they can rule that out. Okay, so as usual in that kind of business, what you do is you assume such a uh, bad object exists, like a solution which would blow up in finite time, but not in L3. And in the end, you find so many properties in that solution that it can only be zero. And since zero is not acceptable, then it didn't exist. The limb soup was replaced by a limit by Serigan a few years uh, later. Okay, so the whole L3 norm blows up. And what I'll discuss now to finish are some extensions of that result. So of course, if you see this in L3, your natural question is, okay, what happens to the other norms, all the Bezoff norms, the MO minus one norm? So to my knowledge, the first result in that direction is due to Jean-Yves Chemin and uh, Fabrice Planchon in 2013. And they proved that essentially, well, you could say all Bezoff norms uh, blow up at blow up time, right? If it's finite, then you can extend the solution, except that they had a rather strong restriction 
on the beta forms. You can get any p from three to infinity, which is fantastic. But q is smaller the larger p is. Okay, so if p is infinity, which is the best thing you can hope for, then q is essentially smaller than two, because p prime is one. So it's, you're not getting at all in any way close to the limits um, of bmo minus one. You're very far from that because of that q. You're quite far from there. Uh, but the proof was uh, very nice because it's essentially almost an energy estimate. <laughs> and using what uh, people call self-improving bounds, which I find very, very beautiful, saying if I take my solution u, the first thing I can do is say it's uh, the heat flow plus the fluctuation. Okay, and what you can prove is that the fluctuation in some sense <laughs> is much nicer than the heat flow because it's a product, it's integrated in time, so in some sense it's smoother. But maybe it's not enough because you want to go all the way to the, what they do in the end is prove that uh, use the infinity L3 argument. So it's smoother but not that much, but then you can do it again, right? So you take your W and you cut it up into uh, something depending only on the heat flow plus something else. And then the something else is even better. And you do that again and again until you end up with a bunch of terms depending only on the heat solution. So that's global and very nice. Plus a term which is now infinity L3. And then you can go and get the uh, uh, scoria zetzer against the F results and you're done, essentially. So it's a very nice proof using those self-improving bounds. And uh, a little bit later with Gabriel Koch and Fabrice Planchon again, we were able to remove that condition that Q had to be very small. So we get all the P's and Q's. Um, so that's uh, nice, except that the proof is a little bit less nice. It uses um, profile decomposition. So seeing the time, I won't be giving you the proof today, but you saw profile decompositions yesterday. And the proof actually follows the roadmap that Kinnig and Mel gave for the Schrodinger equation, if you know it. So it uses profile decompositions for Navier Stokes, which I'd done a very long time ago. And a similar results uh, by um, Carlos Kinnig and Gabriel Koch. And okay, so and then had inter intermediate results with Planchon where we revisited the L3 norm by profile decomposition. And then in the end, we got all the Bessel norms. So it's, it's sort of intricate. I like the proof because it uses profiles, but it's, uh, there's a cost to read that paper. You have to like profiles. And um, I want to mention that paper by Dallas Albritton uh, at the same time, who proved uh, essentially the same results with a much um, a nicer proof in some sense, because it doesn't use profile decompositions. It uses the splitting I mentioned yesterday. If you don't know what to do, split your initial data in two pieces and try to split it in a good way. And he splits the initial data, just like Calderon, into L2 plus something nice, and then uses the rescaling properties of um, or method of uh, Scoriaza, Serigin, Zarak, backward uniqueness, and he proves the result. So it's a very nice uh, argument, which works for all P's and Q's. So uh, obviously when P and Q get very, very big, it gets more and more tricky, but still it works. Um, okay, so I'm, okay, so seeing the time, I guess I shouldn't go through the proof because it's sort of long. If you have any questions, we can discuss that proof. Uh, but then I guess I'll, it would be safer to stop here. And if you want to know more about the proof, uh, I can give it to you if you like. So thanks very much for your attention for those, uh, those lectures. Thank you.